A corpus spongiosum is really hard to find in the female. All right, obviously it's there, but you can see it's shown just here as strands. What forms our glands? Penis. That mushroom-like expansion of the corpus spongiosum is the origin of the glands penis. All right, so if I asked, you know, that table I told you we would have, and I have corpus spongiosum, I mean, uh, glands penis, the origin or it would develop from corpus spongiosum. So same thing in the female, put on the little mushroom cap. So that's the glands clitoris, right? Well, how does it get there? Well, embryologically, there would have been a corpus spongiosum that would extend up onto and form that cap like that, okay? But it breaks down, and if you were to try to dissect it, it's really hard to find. So the two bulbs of the vestigial, two bulbs of the vestigial, stay down. And then where the corpus spongiosum would be, if we could find it, there would be two of them. And they would extend on the ventral surface and then expand to form the glands clitoris, okay? But this side is actually what we tend to see when we're doing a good dissection of the cadaver. So you actually see that little... You just see these two. It's hard that... Okay. You might find some erectile tissue, but it's incomplete. But the glands um, clitoris that develops from it is definitely present. So the glands clitoris origin is Just like it is, the glands penis has its origin from the um, bulb of the penis. I mean, the, the corpus right here. That little yellow cap is the glands clitoris, okay? And it would develop from the corpus spongiosum, just like the glands penis would develop from the corpus spongiosum. It's just that is hard to find. That really is part of it, yes. Is that your question? by the bulbospongiosis, okay? They don't fuse. The bulbospongiosis doesn't fuse like it does in the male. We have two separate, distinct um, pieces of erectile tissue. So this is Netter's diagram. All right, so here's the bulb. Maybe some pieces of the corpus spongiosum and cruce, corpus cavernosum, and glands. I don't know if that plate number is accurate in the newer editions, but it's in the, in the pelvic section. Alrighty. Now, remember Cowper's glands, bulbal urethra glands in the male function to flush out the urethra and function to um, change the pH of the urethra so it's not as acidic. All right, at the posterior aspect of the bulb, we have the bulbal urethra gland of the female. They're going to lubricate the vestibule and like the lower inch or inch and a half or so of the vagina. Okay. There's no urethra, the egg doesn't pass through that, so they don't have that function, but it certainly functions in uh, lubrication. And that would be this kind of round spot back here. Okay. So, on this model right here, yes. Um, I'm just a little confused. It looked like you pointed to the greater vestibular. Same thing. Right greater vestibular, Bartholin. Ah, uh, okay. 
cell names, bubble urethra can be used for both. So like Cowper's and bubble urethra are the same. Greater vestibular, Bartholin's, and bubble urethra are all names for the female. So on this model here, this is the sagittal section. All right, so here's the uterus. Uh, looking externally, this would be the labia minora right here. All right, so just lateral and deep to that. Here would be the corpus, fungi, corpus cavernosa. This would be the cruce running along here, the bulb. And back here is the bulb of your gland. Okay, so I'll pass that along. Let's see it from that view. In the diagram, is mm -hmm. this all, this is all in the pubic arch, right? Right. So, isn't it? This would be the ischial tuberosity right about here. Okay, but isn't it supposed to be greater than 90 degrees? It is. Okay. Right, Dr. Nettis. Okay, so um, we'll be doing what we did in lab, we'll be doing the male, and then if we have time, the female. But I wanted you to, to see this in relationship to this because the structures are very similar. All right. Now, in the male, we talked about erection, emission, and ejaculation. Does the female have erection? Yes. yes. All right. So, what part of the autonomic nervous system, what are the nerves that are involved in erection in the male? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic, which means which splanchnic nerves? Pelvic splanchnic nerves, all right, causing the arterioles to relax and dilate. Same thing happens in the female, but on a smaller schedule, okay? All right, so does the female have a mission? Obviously, there are no sperm, there's no vas deferens, there's no prostate gland or seminal vesicle, all right? But we do have a calper. We have the bulbo urethra glands. So emission would be the only thing close that the female has to that would be secretion of the bulbo urethra glands, lubricating the vestibule and Additional glands, I want a sagittal view here, that are found, you can see this little, there's bulbo urethral, and here are paraurethral glands, not secreting into the vagina, having nothing to do with creating a better passageway for sperm or egg, but going into the urethra just like the prostate gland does. All right? Identified as paraurethral, you'll see that term on the bottom of page somewhere. Bottom of page 96. Now, back in 2002, these were officially recognized as structures homologous to the prostate gland. So the prostate gland secretes prostatic fluid into the urethra during emission. So if we consider the periurethral glands homologous to the prostate glands, and the bulbourethral glands or greater vestibular homologous to the male bulbourethral, the secretion of those glands would be emission, even though we don't have any movement of sperm and no bad deference. So what part of the nervous system controls emission? Sympathetic. So that would be sacral splanchnic. Now, what's ejaculation? Ejaculation is movement of the sperm through the urethra, all right, and with the contraction of the urethral muscle for peristalsis. So the movement of the fluid from the periurethral gland is sometimes called the female ejaculate. So the actual secretion would be emission, but it's movement out the urethra into the vestibular space would be the closest the female could come to ejaculation. So some females, women say, well, I ejaculate. There's this fluid that's produced. I can feel it being, you know, coming out, whether how, how strong a stream it is. Um, and it's like, huh? You're just trying to be a guy. You know, kind of thing. But, it's, and for a long time, they were told that it was urine. But most of the time, urine is acidic. And this fluid is not. All right, it's more of an alkaline nature. 
And so like I said, it was officially recognized as being homologous to the prostate gland. So that's the case, and you, then the contraction of the smooth muscles of the urethra are under parasympathetic control, all right? And the bulbal spongiosis, initial cavernosis muscles contracting during female orgasm would also be pudendal nerve, just like the male. Now, in the male, um, all right, pretend there's no uterus and no vagina. In the male, the prostate gland can be accessed via the rectum, all right? And uh, stimulation through the rectum of the prostate gland enhances sexual inter uh, feelings and orgasm, and that's called the G-spot, prostate gland. So if we consider the periurethral glands homologous to the prostate gland, then the female G-spot, there's been articles and books written about this for years, all right, would be anterior, manipulation, stimulation of the anterior wall of the vagina, which would come in contact then to the deeper periurethral glands. So that those would create the female G-spot enhancing sexual feelings. All right, now let's finish up before our first break by doing a little bit of hammering. Could I erase this diagram? So you're the first class I'm lecturing to where I will not draw in the sinus, okay? 
So I have to circle back and read that, but his, his statement is that the lactiferous duct just continues straight to the nipple. And there is no dilation. Okay? So we'll just call this a lactiferous duct. Out here in the branches, the smaller branches, these are known as alveolar ducts or tubulo-alveolar ducts. So prior to lactation, this is showing uh, actual post ovulation. So in this image here, this is all you see, just the ducts, right? <coughs> There aren't any secretory cells. As estrogen levels rise towards ovulation and stay elevated after ovulation, then some of the duct cells proliferate and become secretory cells. And that's what you're seeing here. So these are the alveoli that occur. The white lines would be the ducts and these alveolar cells would be, the duct cells would proliferate and actually change and start becoming secretory cells. So what I've drawn in red over there matches the red for post-ovulation and would be the cells that develop under the influence of estrogen. So that's going to happen every month. Some women this creates tender breasts. Yes. Are those cells similar to the ones in the lungs? No. They are the they are, they don't they are called alveoli, but the cells in the lungs are simple squamous for diffusion, and these are rounded more cuboidal columnar. They have a protein apparatus, RER and Golgi. So they have a secretory influence. All right. This happens with every menstrual cycle. They are called secretory cells, but they aren't actually making any milk or milk protein. Okay? Then as estrogen levels drop, these secretory cells disappear, and we're back to the duct cells. And that change occurs every month. All right? Now with lactation, towards the end of pregnancy, and then increasing amounts uh, when the infant is born and starts to suck on the nipple and to nurse, then the secretory cells actually start to synthesize milk proteins and components. And so we see milk secretions start to appear within accumulations of these alveoli. Right, so the green would be, what hormone would be required for this? Prolactin. And so the tissue would look like this under histology. However, you would see these accumulations of milk in the ducts around the secretory alveoli. So this would be up here, even though it's the same breast tissue. This would look more like post-ovulation, where we have the alveolar cells, but they're not secretory. And then lactating, where milk is actually being made. There's one more hormone that becomes active here as a Baby is nursing and sucking on the nipple. Sensory neurons go back to the brain. Smell or hearing an infant cry, whether it's yours or your own, can also trigger release of the hormone that binds to muscle-like cells. They're really epithelial cells, but they're muscle-like cells on the outside of the alveoli. They contract and help to squeeze increased pressure to propel the milk towards the nipple. We've also discussed this hormone. But which one is it? Oxytocin, okay? So oxytocin doesn't help make the milk, but it contributes to milk flow. And what's known as the milk letdown reflex. Which is why women who nurse 
naturally have higher levels of oxytocin. And that also goes to the uterus. And remember I said oxytocin causes smooth muscle contraction. So after birth, when you want the smooth muscle of the uterus to stay contracted and inhibit the bleeding uh, from the separated layers of the endometrium, all right, that's going to occur when the baby nurses. Now why it's more painful after the first baby, I don't know. But typically nursing, the first few days of nursing with the second and third children is more cramping uh, occurs than the first child. I don't know if there's more receptors that occur with that second uh, exposure or not, but anyway, that's the case, okay? So let's stop there and take a break. Uh, quarter, come back at quarter up and we'll look at cycles of hormones and um, egg development.